I'm looking at Derek Parfit's view on personal identity, and we could just say this is an investigation of his view on what a person is, although we'll see that that even itself is a misleading title. Uh, we're also going to talk about split brains. In fact, that's how we're going to get started here, by looking at split brain cases. So what do we mean by split brain? Well, in certain cases, in order to stop persistent and very disruptive seizures, there have been operations performed in which the brain is severed in two. The corpus callosum is severed. And so you have this separation of the right and the left hemisphere of the brain. And so what happens is that the right side of the visual field and the left side of the visual field is divided. Now, because of that, you can get some interesting scenarios with various instructions. There are different results. And it implies that there are two streams of consciousness, says Parfit. Or maybe there's only one stream of consciousness that's truly conscious. Now, I've taken this next slide from a Scientific American, uh, and I don't have the specifics on where it came from. Apologies to Scientific American for that. Uh, but here's what's going on. If you look at the middle uh, section there, uh, if somebody is looking at a screen after they've had this operation performed, and they're told to focus on the dot, and so the the right visual field, which is processed by the left hemisphere, sees the word face. You ask the person what they saw, and they will say face. Now, if going to the right panel, if the word face is simply shown on the left side of the screen as they're looking at the dot, their left visual field will process that in the right hemisphere, which does not have uh, as good of language development. And they're going to say nothing, that they saw nothing. But if they're asked to draw what they saw, they would draw, and it has to be with their left hand, of course, as it's shown here, uh, because the right hemisphere controls the left hand, uh, they would draw a face. And so they would kind of be surprised at that. Uh, they said they didn't see anything, and yet they're able to draw a face. So likewise, if a person is sitting in front of this screen, and they're told to be looking at the dot in the middle, and then these images are just flashed up there for a moment so that the eyes can't wander from side to side, and they're asked what they see, they will respond that they see a lion. But then when asked to draw what they saw with their left hand, they will draw a rabbit. Uh, and I'm not who, sure who gets credit for the photo on the left, but I took the one on the right. I took the one of the lion. So sorry for whoever took the one on the left. It's a little fuzzy anyway. You probably don't want credit. Okay, so let's consider what Parfit does with this. He describes his view, which is the bundle theory. And Parfit concludes that those split brain cases show that there are actually two streams of consciousness in the cases, uh, but they're not two people. I, I don't think anyone would say that. And so you conclude that there are two streams of consciousness, but there aren't two people. And Parfit supports what's called the bundle theory. Now, the bundle theory, of course, will go into greater detail, but it has had proponents with Hume in the Western tradition, with Buddha in the Eastern tradition, and Parfit, in fact, uh, references Buddha. He is a Buddhist and uh, says that there's good support there from that tradition. So the view is that we persons, and you have to kind of put that in quotes, are bundles of thoughts and emotions and beliefs. What actually only exists are those bundles, and there are no persons. So uh, let's carry this through a little bit more carefully. 
Um, we are bundles in the sense that there is no entity that is the single subject of experience for normal people, right? Everyone is the claim. But more accurately, there are merely experiences that occur together in time and space. And of course, they have causal relations among them. So everyone is like the split brain case. Um, it's just that they haven't been separated out so that we can sh show that with results in experimental uh, situations that make it clear. And so Parfit says, in a sense, the bundle theorist denies the existence of persons which is the view of Buddhism, ultimately. And so there are no persons. So I say this is his view of personal identity. Well, there's really no personal identity over time because no persons exist. But let's contrast this and, and make it clear why Parfit has this view. Uh, first of all, he describes an ego theory, uh, most prominent uh, or well-known supporter might be that of Descartes, for example. The idea that there's an individual person or an ego, uh, not to get confused with Freudian uh, psychology, but just an ego, that's what the person is. And Parfit acknowledges that we have beliefs that imply the truth of the ego theory, that there is such an entity as a person and that's what we are. So the bundle theorist has to say something about those beliefs that seem to imply the truth of the ego theory. And he talks through some cases. So one case would be teletransportation. And the idea here is there's a machine that uh, reads the states of, of every, every cell in your body. It reads those and it destroys those and then reproduces those in a different location. Now, if that were to occur, some think I would not survive. I guess in the Star Trek universe, you think you would survive, but if everything is destroyed and then reproduced, it does give you some reason to think you didn't survive. And a reason for this would be the possibility of duplication. I mean, if you could do that and reproduce the person, to use the term, on another planet, say, then why not be able to do it twice? Well, then you would have two persons, which obviously cannot be the same person. Um, so such an intuition seems to imply um, an ego theory is true, because once you start destroying the cells, you're gone. And then other things can be produced, but they're not going to be you, right? That's the idea. Now, there is a problem for the ego theory. And the problem is, what if there's a gradual replacement of the neurons? What would you say about that? Surely a few wouldn't hurt. So it seems that we've been able to do this in certain cases in 21st century technology. Um, if you're only re uh, replacing a few neurons, it seems like you would survive that. But if you're going to have 98% of your neurons, of course, it seems like you would not survive that. That's a lot more similar to teletransportation. And if you conclude you don't survive teletransportation, then it seems obvious you wouldn't survive 98% replacement either. And so we need to clarify the assumptions of the ego theory. And there are two main ones. The ego theory implies, or maybe better stated, I think, assumes the truth of two logical principles, which are broadly accepted logical principles, but in a application for persons. And one would be the principle of non-contradiction. Uh, the idea is that you cannot both survive and not survive, which the ego theory would affirm. Certainly, that would seem to be the case. You either survive or you do not. You can't have both. And also, the principle of excluded middle 
the idea that there's no partial survival. There's no middle ground to this. There's no vague, well, sort of surviving. Uh, people aren't the kind of things that can sort of survive, but not completely survive. Okay, so Parfit says these implications, or we can draw implications from these assumptions that speak against the ego theory. So if the ego theory were true, then it seems like you would have to have an answer to this question. At what percentage would you not survive? If you can survive a few or maybe one or two percent replacement, well, and you don't survive 98 percent replacement, do you just have 50 percent as the middle ground? Well, that means 49 percent replacement of neurons, you're okay, but 51 percent, you're not okay. And any answer there seems to be absurd. And so Parfit concludes the ego theory is false based on that. Now, even though we have some initial beliefs that lead us to the ego theory, those must not be correct. So the bundle theory is better off. Now, of course, just as a comment here, not Parfit's own view, all theories are going to have to have some trade-offs on what they think is uh, plausible to continue to believe. Obviously, Parfit is rejecting the ego theory. One of the reasons would be uh, you have as a conclusion of his view uh, that survival is a mere convention. Whether you survive or not is a matter of mere wording. So you could say you survive maybe for legal purposes, or you could say you don't survive. Uh, Farfet is similar to what Chisholm said, uh, Roderick Chisholm said about boats and identity over time. He said, we just have conventions or we let the legal system determine it. And the, but ultimately there's no real answer. It's just a matter of convention to decide whether to say we survived or whether to say we didn't survive. But of course, for Parfit's view, the best response to the question on whether or not you survive is actually never. You never survive. You're not the same person as you were yesterday because there was no person. There was just a bundle of experiences that were there then. And there's a different bundle of experiences that are here now. And so you could compare what Parfit has to say about people to, say, clubs or sports teams. You know, we could take this seriously as the analogy is taken very seriously, that is. So we have some problematic cases with brain transplants or uh, the Cleveland Browns football team, which originated in Cleveland, existed for several years as the Cleveland Browns, but then the franchise was moved along with all of its players and coaches. Well, not all of them, but the, most of the players and cultures moved to Baltimore. They became known as the Ravens. And then later, the Cleveland reinstituted a team called the Cleveland Browns. Anyway, what, what kind of, what do you say about the existence of the Cleveland Browns in that case? Well, it's a matter of convention or, or law. You just settle it that way. And so uh, with people, it's just very similar. We just say whatever you want. Convention will settle it. And our intuitions though, that we want to survive and we have those intuitions. I mean, it seems to matter to us whether or not we die today or we live several more years. I mean, that seems to be a really important question. Uh, that's an all or nothing kind of assumption that the ego theory implies, but that's misguided, that idea. So even in normal survival, uh, it's just like teletransportation. It's like being destroyed and replaced by a replica, something the ego theorist says would be bad, and that you wouldn't survive. But the bundle theory says, well, you wouldn't survive, but it's as good or as bad as you might think. It's not that different than normal life. So Parfit claims that the split brain cases 
give us scientific evidence for the bundle theory. The idea is that there is a bundle that's separated under two uh, certain circumstances. You can separate it out and you can demonstrate that this bundle can be separated. It's like um, a rope that's bound and it's no more differ difficult than separating the strands of a rope. That's what we are. We're kind of like a rope, but we can separate the strands. The, you know, the substance still is there. The experiences, beliefs, and actions are still there. And that's what a person is, according to Parfit. Another issue then seems to be uh, distinguishing between persons and subjects of experiences for the ego theorists, right? The ego theorists would have to make that distinction between the two, and then they would have to claim that there are actually two subjects of experiences in the split brain cases. That's what it seems to be going on. So you, you claim that you don't see anything, but then you draw a rabbit, right? Uh, there seems to be two different separate uh, subjects of experiences those in those cases. But the unification of those two experiences individually would just be the fact that they are subjects of experiences. So the, the question is, are persons actually subject of experiences or not? This is a challenge for the ego theorists from Parfit's view. If you answer that question, yes, then it seems like there are two persons in us because they could be separated with that operation. But if that's not the case, if persons are not subject subjects of experiences, then what are they? The question doesn't seem to be have a clear answer for the ego theorists. Now, there is another case of uh, Wiggins. David Wiggins describes, sorry, a brain hemisphere transplant the idea there is you do the separation like we've uh, described with the split brain cases, only now you take half the hemisphere and put it in a new uh, body with a, a, an empty shell for the brain, and you do the same with the other half of the hemisphere, so you end up with two functioning people. Now, uh, this would be science fiction, of course, and it's not clear that we could ever be able to do this uh, successfully. Uh, but that's the idea of the brain hemisphere transplant. And then you could ask the question, what are the resulting persons? So it seems like such persons could exist and, and be people. They, they would have experiences. They might be able to draw, but not speak very well. And the other one could speak, uh, but you know, not draw very well with one hand or something like that. Does either case have a resulting person that actually survived. It would seem that neither person is me if I went under, were to undergo that kind of brain transplant. It would seem that I've ceased to exist. But from Parfit's perspective, uh, that ceasing to as, exist is about as good or as bad as ordinary survival. It's really not any different. Now, uh, just a, a couple comments on some responses. Of course, there are other theorists who will argue for the ego theory, but uh, there are some responses to Parfit. There need not to be the same type of ontological grounding is one response for persons as there are for unified conscious experiences. So, Again, to separate the two and say, well, persons are one thing, unified conscious experiences are something else. Now that's related to uh, conscious and unconscious experience. So for example, a normal person lacks complete awareness of what's going on with all of their mental activity, right? We have an unconscious, that a, a, a portion uh, psychologically speaking, that we're not aware of, but that doesn't seem to be a problem for an ego theorist. And it's similar with these separations, so to speak, or different functionings of the left brain and the right brain. On the issue of 49% replacement, 
vagueness might exist in the world or probably better response from the ego theorist perspective it's not vagueness in the world that actually is occurring it's simply epistemic uncertainty we just don't know uh which is the surviving half certainly that would be chisholm's response um who is not uh, an ego theorist technically as Parfit describes, because Parfit seems to imply that there the ego would have to be something that's not material. Um, Chisholm, though, would be an ego theorist for all uh, purposes in terms of the beliefs and consistency. And he would have the response that you either go with one direction or a different direction, but not both or possibly you do die in such a case of hemisphere transplants. Now, uh, of course, there are a lot of other uh, perspectives on this topic, uh, namely Swinburne is one, and so we'll look at Swinburne in a different video.